The Clyde Beatty Show. The world's greatest wild animal trainer, Clyde Beatty, with an exciting adventure from his brilliant career. The circus means thrills, excitement, snarling jungle beasts. The circus means fun for young folks and old. But under the big top, you see only a part of the story. The real drama comes behind the scenes, where 500 people live as one family, where Clyde Beatty constantly risks death in the most dangerous act on earth. This master of the big cats has journeyed to Africa and India, hunting down his beasts in their native jungle. All of this is part of the Clyde Beatty story. This is the adventure with the Lion of Kintampo. The port of Takoradi lies sweltering in the equatorial sun of the Gold Coast of Africa. From the deep, dark waters of this harbor once sailed the slave traders, their holds crammed with human cargo. And yet Takoradi's legends do not all lie in the dim past. For this very port was the scene of one of the most thrilling adventures of Clyde Beatty. Takoradi. Will I ever forget it? I'd gone to the Gold Coast to bring back some lions and had met with real success. There were five of the big cats, all crated and ready to be transferred to shipboard. Five handsome specimens of the king of beasts. But even among these five, one stood out. Yes, one was really a king among kings. The Lion of Kintampo, as he was called by the native chieftain who sold him to me, was the finest two-and-a-half-year-old I'd ever seen. From the moment I first laid eyes on him, I made up my mind that nothing must stop me from getting him safely to America. But little did I dream what lay in store for me and for the Lion of Kintampo in the old port of Takoradi. We return to the Clyde Beatty Show in just a moment. And now, back to Clyde Beatty. Luck seemed to be against me from the first there in the old port of Takoradi. The ship that was to carry me, my wife Harriet, and our cargo was three days late putting in. Three days of sticky, fly-ridden heat that sapped the energies and frayed the nerves of man and beast alike. Then at last came the night before we were to sail. Harriet and I stood talking in the warehouse where I kept the crated lion. The lion of Kintampo. Just look at him. Yeah. Decided yet what you're going to call him, Clyde? No, Harriet, nothing seems to fit. I want a name that's different, distinctive. As distinctive as this fellow is. Thought and thought. Look, Harriet. You'd better go back to the hotel now. Oh, but... The flashlight's annoying His Majesty, and if he keeps this up much longer, he'll have the others on edge. All right. But I wish you'd change your mind. About what? Spending the night here. Why, you haven't left your cats in this warehouse since we arrived at Takarati. No, and I won't, until we're ready to sail. But it's so stifling here. Back at the hotel, there's at least an electric fan. And you can lock the warehouse securely. <laughs> Harriet, you've been married to me long enough to know that when my mind is made but up... But nobody, it... nothing is going to bother the cats. If you insist on someone being here, why not Gambaga? He's one native you can trust. Yes, I can trust him to see you safely back to the hotel. So if you'll kindly stick your head out of that door, Mrs. Beatty, and call him, I... Wonder what... Why, it can't be Gambaga. He's the type that'd wait silently outside if it took till eternity. A thousand pardons, Mr. Beatty. Huh? But I saw a ray of light through the crack in the door, and since I hurried to Takarade especially to see you... See me? About what? Uh, please, if I may step inside, I should be most happy to explain. Yes, come in, but I'll have to ask you to make your explanation brief, because... Ah, but, of course. Ah, this must be Mrs. Beatty. My name is Shelp. How do you do? Uh, not Shelp, the animal dealer. <laughs> the same. I am flattered that the world's foremost trainer of wild animals should have heard of me. Well, you'd hardly be flattered, Shelp, if I told you what I'd heard. Hmm. We all have our enemies. Yes, even the great Clyde Beatty. What do you mean by that? Oh, no offense, Mrs. Beatty. 
I merely repeat what I heard in Kintampo. Oh, when were you there? Since you yourself left. This a lion. You are aware, no doubt, of the tribe of lion worshippers to whom the lion of Kintampo was a devil god. So that's what you came to tell us. No, Harriet, our visitor is a very practical man. I'm sure he has a very practical reason for being here. <laughs> An excellent observation, Mr. Beatty. Excellent. I came to see if the beast you have created here lives up to the reports I've heard. Mr. Shelp, you can see that you're beginning to annoy both the lion and me. Now, if you want to see him, come to my circus the next time you're in the States. <laughs> I like your bluntness, Mr. Beatty. Hmm. And though it may not be good business for me to say so, I like this lion very much. Ah, very much indeed. That doesn't interest me in the least. Uh, then I will come right to the point. The decimal point. <laughs> Two thousand dollars. Two thousand? You want to buy him? But of course. He's not for sale. Mr. Beatty, Africa is full of lions. You can find others. I was just going to point that out to you. But I have been searching for a beast like this one for years. You and I both. Hmm. Mr. Beatty, be sensible. The life of a wild animal trainer is hazardous enough. Do not make it more so. Are you threatening me? My dear man, why should I threaten? I merely point out that this is bound to be a very unlucky beast. After all, he carries a curse. But you're not afraid of the curse, I take it. Me? I want him merely to sell again. And I already have the customer. Three thousand. You evidently didn't hear me. I said he's not... Four thousand. You'd pay four thousand dollars for an animal that hasn't been trained yet? Paid to you at your bank in New York. Well, Mr. Beatty, what do you say? What I've said from the first, this lion is not for sale. Oh, but it Now is get a... out of here. So, as you say, my dear Beatty, but I would have you know that I am not accustomed to such treatment. <coughs> you may yet have cause to regret it. I sent Harriet off to the hotel under the watchful eye of Gambaga, the native porter who'd come with us from Quintampo. Then I tried to sleep. But for a long time, sleep wouldn't come and the thought of Shelp wouldn't go. I was up at dawn supervising the removal of my crated lines to the wharf where our ship had anchored during the night. In the coolness of early morning and the bustle of activity, I shook off my forebodings of the night before. But soon I had a new worry. Hey there! You at the winches! Not so fast! Not so fast, I said! Slow up! You see what you did? You let that crate down so hard on the deck you almost smashed it. And the lion inside. You're talking to me. I certainly am. Jack Tate don't like being talked to like that. Ask anybody. Well, I don't like the way you've been operating those winches. Oh, you don't, huh? I didn't say anything when you handled the first two crates so recklessly, but now that you've done even worse with the third... You're I... Beatty, huh? Yes, I'm Beatty. Yeah, Clyde Beatty, the wild animal tamer. I don't tame wild animals. Nobody does. I train them. And now you want to train me how to operate the winches, huh? Well, what'd you say if I told you to mind your own business? I'd say that I am minding my own business. Those crates have to be handled delicately. Yeah, I wouldn't call a 500-pound lion exactly delicate. I wonder what you would call one if you smashed his crate and he got out and came at you. Let me worry about that. As for you, Beatty... Yes? If you want those oversized kittens of yours loaded aboard so we can move out with the tide, you better scram. All right, Tate, but remember, I'll be watching from the wharf. Clyde. Harriet. <laughs> What's the idea of creeping up behind me like that? Clyde, he's here. Huh? Who's here? Shelp, the man who threatened you last night. He's been standing off to one side watching you for half an hour. Oh, so that's what you've been doing with your time, watching him. I thought you'd turned into a sleepyhead. Another few minutes and I'd have sent Gambaga Clyde, after you. he's walking toward us. Hmm? Oh, oh, you mean Shelp. Well, and how are Mr. and Mrs. Clyde Beatty on this suffocating morning? Hardly in the mood for chatter, especially with you, Shelp. Oh, but you have not forgotten what I said last night. About such things as the curse. What makes you so sure? You almost jumped when your wife stepped up behind you. Yes, you, Clyde Beatty, celebrated the world over for nerves of steel. If you've spoken your piece, Shelp, I But no, I have not. What I came over to say was, and this is my final offer, 
5,000. 5,000? You really want that lion, don't you? Send it as a deal? Shelp, get it through your head once and for all. That animal is not for sale, and that's final. Mm. You are a stubborn one, eh, Betty? Such a stubborn one. <sighs> Clyde, I'll be so happy when we've left this port behind us. So will I, Harriet. Oh, look, they're ready to hoist the next crate aboard. Oh, good. That fool, he's running those winches even faster than before. Tate, Tate, what do you think you're doing? Oh, that fool. Oh, it's all right, Clyde. The crate didn't break open. Yes, but I'm not going to take any more chances. Wait here. Oh, where are you going? To have a talk with the captain. Come in, come in. Well, and if it isn't Mr. Beatty, and how is this sweltering heat affecting... Well, something wrong? I'm afraid so, Captain. It's about Tate. Oh? What about me, Beatty? Tate, when I want you, I'll send for you. Now, on with you before I... Captain, if you don't mind, I'd just as soon have Tate stay. Well, all right, then. What's the trouble, Mr. Beatty? No trouble. The man just don't like the way I handle his precious crates. But did I bust any? Did I hurt his darling lions? You came closer than you may think, Tate. That's why I'm asking the captain to put another man at the winches before we load the last and most important crate. Hmm, I see. Captain, you ain't gonna let him run your ship for you. There's only one man runs me ship, Tate, and that's me. That's telling him. It's you that needs telling, Tate. Now listen to me. Mr. Beatty here wants me to put another man at the winches temporarily. I go on one better. I'm putting another man there permanently. Uh, yeah, huh? Yeah. Now, Tate, I put up with you for the last time. The steward will give you your pay and passage money back to home port. I don't even want the likes of you aboard me ship. Aye, aye, sir. I was tired of this old tub anyway. Then get a move on you. Sure. But first I got something to say to Mr. Beatty. Yes? I'll be seeing you. And I don't mean in a circus. Captain, I'm sorry to have stirred up all this trouble. Oh, forget it, Mr. Beatty. He's an honorary customer, that Tate. And I should have given him his papers long ago. As for the handling of the winches, you can put your mind at ease. I already have. Oh, good, good. The fact is, I've got a man who will handle that last crate of yours as if it was full of eggs. Well, he doesn't have to be quite that careful. <laughs> anyway, come along while I have a talk with him. Be glad to. Captain! Captain! Harriet! Yeah, what is it, Mrs. Beatty? Smoke pouring out of one of the hatches. The ship is on fire! <laughs> Pour it on, lads, pour it on. We've got the whole Atlantic Ocean to put out the fire with, and put it out we will if it takes every last drop. But no one will ever say that Kim Callahan let one burn up under him as she lay at her moorings. Captain? Yeah, yes, Mr. Beatty. From what I can see, the fire's pretty well under control now. Yeah, there it is. But I'm taking no chances. You know, when I think what might have happened if your missus hadn't noticed the smoke coming out of that hatch when she did... Yeah, it was a lucky thing Harriet came aboard the ship looking for me just then. Lucky's the word, all right. And if ever I find out that it was somebody, and not just something, that set fire to me vessel, he'll be sorry he was ever born. Then there is a chance, Captain, that the fire started from natural causes. Well, yes, but I know what you're thinking. And that was my first thought, too. Tate. Aye... Jack Tate. So here you are, Clyde. Yes, Harriet, and I've been right here on the wharf for some time. Well, why did you dash off and come here? Well, it suddenly struck me that the fire itself might have been a decoy to distract attention from something else. Oh? And so I made a beeline for that crate holding the Lion of Quintampo. Oh. Oh, but everything's all right. So far as I can see. Uh, at last, the signal to hoist the remaining crate on board. <sighs> well, there it goes. Just think, Clyde. In another hour, we'll be at sea. Harriet. What? The sling, the sling attached to the crate. Most of the strands have been cut. It's giving way. Look out! He's loose! The Lion of Quintampo is loose! <laughs> We continue with this exciting story after this message.
And now to resume Clyde Beatty's adventure, The Lion of Kintampo. More than once in my years as a trainer, I had seen a wild animal break loose, but always before there had been some means of confining the killer to a limited area. But the Lion of Kintampo that morning on the docks of old Takarati was really on the loose. He stood now among the splinters of his fallen crate, tossing his luxurious mane as though partially stunned. In front and behind and around him were only those strange two-legged creatures known as humans, most of them shocked into immobility. As long as they remained immobile, things might be all right. I had seconds, only seconds, in which to make my plans. Clyde, the town. Yes, Harriet, that's our principal danger. If the lion got loose inside the town... He's got it... to be cut off at the customs gate. Right. Take up your stand, grab something, anything to drive him back in case he appears, and stay there until he's captured. Oh, yes, Clyde. Move slowly, Harriet, and, and take care of yourself. You too, Clyde. I grabbed up the nearest object that could serve me as a weapon, a piece of the splintered crate. Half a minute had passed, but I knew that my time for taking action was running out. The lion's head had cleared completely now. I started toward him, waving my makeshift club, intent on holding his attention. And all the time, I was cautioning the others. Listen, everybody! Keep standing right where you are! Whatever you do, don't break and run! You're all safe unless you make him turn his attention to you. Give me time and I'll coax him to the deserted part of the wharf. He's about to come after me. It's working. Keep your heads, everybody. Keep your heads. It was Tate who screamed. Then he turned and ran, and after him, like a sinewy streak of lightning, went the lion. With a swipe of a paw, the lion knocked him sprawling. But the animal's lunge had carried him 15 feet beyond his intended prey. It gave me the last possible chance of saving Tate. Luckily, I'd put on my holster that morning. The pistol contained only blanks. But maybe they could do the trick. Maybe. The lion had whirled and was about to spring again. It worked. The lion of Quintampo forgot about the fallen man and turned his hatred to the blazing pistol and me. I was live bait, moving backwards, ever backwards, luring the lion onto the deserted part of the wharf. My safety depended on sidestepping when he lunged at me. Well, well, baby, it's okay now. Not entirely, Captain. I've got him cornered, but only temporarily. Any moment, he'll hurdle that pile of lumber and boxes and come after me. Yeah, don't I know that. And that's why I brought this. A gun? With rare bullets. I'll take it, Captain, but I hope I don't have to use it. You've got to use it, man. For your safety and the safety of all concerned. You ought to see what that lion did to Tate with one swipe of a paw. How is Tate? Oh, the rascal will live. But if you ask me, he'll always have a game on. That's why... Look, Captain, my first thought is to keep that animal from hurting anyone else. But if I shoot and only wound him, it'll be a real nightmare. Besides, I think I've hit on a way of capturing him alive without harm to anybody. And how's that? The warehouse that I was using is empty. I'm going to try to maneuver him inside there. He'll take a heap of maneuvering. Sure it will. But I got him here, didn't I? Well... Give me a chance, and I'll give you my word that if anything goes wrong, I'll use the gun. Okay, Beatty. Anything you want me to do? Yes, Captain. Clear everybody out between here and the warehouse and see that the door of the warehouse is open. He got you. Anything else? Yes, hurry. Here he comes again. It was almost a mile to the warehouse, and every foot of the way was marked with danger. Every time the lion of Quintampo lunged and missed, he became all the more infuriated, all the more determined to get me. But finally, finally it was over, and I found myself slamming and padlocking the door of the warehouse. Lady, I never thought anyone could do it, even you. Oh, my hand on it, man. Thanks, Captain. There was more than one time, though, when I didn't think I could do it myself. Oh, did you now? But you know something? I can't figure out what you're going to do with the beast now that you've got him in the blinking warehouse. I myself have been wondering about that little thing, Betty. Oh, have you, Shelp? I've been wondering about something else. Indeed. In wondering who it was that cut through most of the strands on the sling of the crate. Uh, you really mean it was done deliberately? <laughs> Well, I cannot say that it surprises me. I didn't think it would. As I've told you all along, Beatty, you have enemies. 
The seaman Tate among them. Oh, Tate keeps babbling that he didn't do it. Naturally. But the point is, my dear Beatty, you could have avoided all this and been $5,000 richer if you had not been so stupidly stubborn. Listen, Shell. Why don't you go inside and get your lion, Beatty? You and your cheap heroics. You do not feel so brave at this moment, do you, Beatty? Shell, do you still want the lion of Quintampo? I want him. What kind of a question is this? It's a straight question. Uh, you mean, Beatty, you've decided to sell him after all? Not sell him, give him away. See, I knew you were merely talking nonsense. The captain is my witness, Shelp, and no man has ever accused me of going back on my word. There's only one condition to your getting that lion. Aha, uh -huh. now it comes. I'm going to get a cage and put it up against the open door. Then the lion can be driven out of the warehouse and right into the cage. So? Just this. You go in there with the tools of the animal trainer's trade, a pistol loaded with blanks, a four-legged stool, and a whip, and drive him out, and he's all yours, free of charge. Well, Shelp? I... Uh, you think Johannes Shelp is an idiot? He is your lion, Beatty. Let him crunch your bones. Good day. I've got half a mind to crunch his bones myself, also free of charge. Never mind, Captain. By the way, here's your gun. Oh, yes. Clyde. Oh, Clyde. Hello, Harry. Gumbago brought me the news. You've no idea what a strain it's been. I was frantic guarding the customer's gate all this time. Anyway, it's over. And as soon as we get an open cage up against the door, I'll go in and drive him out. Clyde, you mean we'll drive him out? You and I? No, Harriet, I'm going in there alone. <laughs> Mr. Beatty, everything seems to be all set now, eh? All set for you to go into the warehouse after your lion. Yes, Captain. I've even stationed Gambaga at the side door of the building, just in case. Well, here goes. Wait, Clyde. What is it, Harriet? Clyde, we've been together in all sorts of danger. It's out of the question, Mrs. Beatty. Be seeing you. My first hazard inside the warehouse was an optical one getting my eyes accustomed to the darkness. Once that was accomplished, I moved slowly, stealthily ahead. The moment of greatest danger I knew would be when the Lion of Quintampo and I first met. If he got the jump on me, all I had was my pistol of blanks, a four-legged stool, and a whip to defend myself. A big cat weighing 500 pounds can move as stealthily as a kitten weighing ounces. Was he stalking me? Was he poised, even now, poised to spring at me from behind? I explored the entire bottom floor, but nothing happened. There was an upstairs loft toward the back of the building, and that's where he had to be. I'd have to climb up there after him, and the stairway was steep. If I met him there, if he came hurtling at me, then I was finished. But at last, I was up. Now the lion and I were together in the loft. It was then it happened. Down below, the side door suddenly swung open and Gambaga, the native, stood revealed in a shaft of light. Lion of Kintampo, take your freedom! Gambaga, what are you doing? Slam that door! Get out! Get out, Gambaga! He shall be free! My tribe has willed it! Lion shall be free! The next moment, the lion had sprung past me, flashing toward the figure standing in the shaft of light. Gambaga didn't move, didn't flinch, until the beast was upon him, and then it was too late. Ah! Take a last look, Harriet. Another minute, and the lights of the old port of Takarati will be only a memory. Just as the day's events are only a memory now. The day's events. To think, Clyde, it was Gambaga who cut the sling. Yes, Harriet, if only we'd known that Gambaga was a member of the tribe that worshipped the Lion of Quintampo as its devil god. Poor Gambaga, dead, and his sacred lion safe in the hole of this ship. You know, I can't help thinking that if that big cat hadn't been so interested in his victim, I might never have been able to drive him into the cage. Yes, I'll never forget how that animal... Harriet. What, Clyde? I... I just thought of something. Oh? A name, a perfect name for this Lord of Lions. Yes, we'll call him Devil God.
We return to Clyde Beatty in a moment. Our next episode is called Noah's Ark. Here is just a portion of the adventure that occurred in the prairie land of the Southwest. I was about two-thirds through my act when the storm broke. I could hear the loosened poles of the tent structure bobbing up and down, an unmistakable sign that a heavy gale was blowing outside. Suddenly, there was a terrific clap of thunder. We're lucky you were near the safety cage, Clyde. That thunder's got the cat scared to death. Yeah, a thunderstorm will make him even harder to handle. Clyde, look. They're beginning to fight and claw each other. I'll get them straightened out. Oh, don't go in, Clyde. Please, let them fight it out. I have to go back in, Harriet. Hank, keep loading revolvers with blanks. I'm going to need them. Believe me, nothing disturbs me like the thought of thunder and lightning catching up with me when I'm in the ring with my lions and tigers. And that's just what happens in our next story, Noah's Ark. This story was based on incidents in the life of Clyde Beatty and the Clyde Beatty Circus. The Clyde Beatty Show was produced by Shirley Thomas. The Lion of Contampo was written by Maurice Zim. All names used were fictional, and any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a Commodore production.